The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hi, welcome everybody to Coffee with Kalafi. Uh, I want to say thanks, first of all, for joining us today and also for your ongoing support of Kalafi, of our presentations and our products. Thanks for that. Um, proud to introduce John as our uh, presenter today. He's a friend of mine and certainly a, a voice of reason in the industry, and he's put together a great uh, presentation on this uh, topic of heat metering, and we also have a product available that fits this category. So we got a lot to cover. In fact, we're probably going to run 90 minutes today, so hopefully everybody can stick with us. So uh, Idronix 24, you should have this by now. It's on the street. Let us know if you're not getting this or uh, if these uh, are getting mailed to you, certainly go to our website and sign up for them. But this is, uh, talks about what we're talking about today. And uh, there's some of the back issues. So uh, there's the web address that you can sign up for those. They're also available as a PDF on our website if you want some information. So I'm probably going to turn it over to Siggy here, I think, and uh, I'll mute out so you don't get any background noise. Sounds good, Bob. Thank you. And uh, glad to be with you, folks. I, I know we got a good size audience, and we're going to we're going to take a fundamental look at heat metering technology. It's a very new technology in North America, but it's been extensively used in other parts of the world. So we're going to look at kind of the underlying principles of it today. Uh, we're going to look at the benefits of heat metering. We're also going to look at how do you actually incorporate a heat meter into a system? What's the physical hardware that's involved? And then we'll finish up with some example applications of where you can apply heat metering. Uh, it's, it's a technology that can be broadly applied both within a building, uh, even within individual spaces in a building, and expanding that up in scale as, as much as a, a large district heating system. The, the fundamental concepts are all pretty much the same. So uh, let's get going here. Now, oftentimes we, uh, we get asked to deal with heating systems or cooling systems in buildings like apartments or condominiums or perhaps, perhaps uh, leased office spaces where we have these individual occupied units. And uh, what's a typical approach for providing separately billed heating and cooling in these kind of buildings? And oftentimes the answer or the solution has been to install separate HVAC systems. And with that, uh, typically separately metered electrical services. And if gas is being used as the heating fuel, there's going to be a separate gas meter. So here's just an example of building I happen to go by down in Pennsylvania. And you can see the electric meters here pretty common to have separately metered electrical service and over here next to it are the separate gas meters here's another project uh, up not too far from where i live not quite as neat as the first photo there you can see the master meter over here on the left and then the header and in this particular project they had to run separate uh, looks like a black iron pipe up over the roof to get to each of the uh, furnaces or whatever the combustion loads were in these individual spaces and it looks kind of ugly and, and certainly it, it potentially would be more prone to damage or vandalism and i also want to point out that uh, just about every utility a gas utility is going to have a basic service charge associated with each meter so i i just picked one at random here um Louisville Gas and Electric out of uh, Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. And they're charging about $2.25 per month for the electric meter and then a little more, $16.35 per month for each of those gas meters. And of course, as gas usage goes down, as energy conservation measures are um, applied to greater extents, the basic service charge becomes a larger and larger percentage of the overall bill. In fact, in very low energy use houses, you actually may pay more to have the gas meter attached to the house in, in terms of 12 months at, let's say, $16 a month than what the, the actual usage of the gas may be. So um, it, it all adds up. So what are some of the consequences of that approach? And, and again, we're going to assume that we're using natural gas or propane as, as the fuel, where the quote unquote solution, traditional approach, I should call it, would be to have a separate boiler or furnace in each one of those spaces. But one of the things you're going to find quickly is that when these spaces are relatively small, think in terms of maybe a thousand square feet or less, the heating loads 
can be fairly small and it's difficult to find furnaces uh, or boilers that are down in the range of 20, 25,000 BTUs per hour. So one of the consequences is uh, if it were to be a boiler, for example, about the smallest gas fired boiler that I'm aware of is about 50,000 BTUs per hour. Now it can modulate down to about 10,000 BTUs per hour, but it's still oversized relative to the peak design load. And of course that reduces its efficiency. Um, every space that has a separate heat source in it is going to require space and access for maintenance. Uh, you, you've got to have uh, clearances around this equipment. Uh, certainly during servicing, there's going to be some noise. There might be odors generated. Uh, there's going to be traffic through the space. These are all negatives. Uh, they're, they're all uh, um, indicators that there's a, perhaps a better solution. So uh, each space that has a separate mechanical system needs floor or wall space to put that hardware. Uh, we talked about the separate meters and associated basic service charges. Uh, the need to run gas piping throughout the building. Now that one photo we looked at where all the piping runs across the roof, and there's probably several hundred feet of gas piping. And sure it can be installed, but it's uh, it's not an ideal scenario. Uh, it's certainly not ideal from a safety standpoint if you can avoid having a fuel gas piping system in a building. Um, uh, limit it to just one area of the building as an option. Uh, arguably, that's a safer approach. Now, another consideration, and again, this is a small uh, a strip mall retail space near me. If you look at this photo in the lower right, those yellow arrows, if you look very closely, they're all pointing to B vents that pop up through the roof. So there has to be a separate venting system for each one of these combustion appliances. Uh, that adds cost, it adds maintenance because Obviously, you have more roof penetrations that eventually might require some type of service. So there's quite a few reasons that speak to the the current uh, trend of, of putting a separate mechanical system in each one of these spaces, that there's got to be something that's an improvement on that. And there is, and that is using a centralized plant for heat production. It could certainly be within the building or it could be outside the building, but it's a centralized production along with individual metering to each one of these spaces. And fundamentally, what a heat metering system is, is we have some kind of a heat source over here. It could be boilers, it could be heat pumps, solar collectors, any combination. Um, it could be waste heat recovery. It doesn't really matter what the heat source is, as long as there is a, a source there that can keep up with the load and can generate water temperatures that are compatible with the distribution system. So we have a pipe that's taking the heated water over and of course a circulator. And over on the right here, we have some kind of a load. And again, this could be an apartment, an office, a retail shop. So what's the hardware that is specific to the heat meter? Well, we need to measure temperature of the fluid going from the heat source to the load as well as the temperature from the load back to the heat source. And we call that the delta T or the temperature drop of the water, or it could be an antifreeze solution. We'll, we'll talk about the differences shortly. So we get delta T and we also have to measure the flow rate. If we know the delta T and the flow rate, there's two things that we can calculate from that. And I'm sure many of you have done this calculation at, at one time or another. Uh, essentially with water, it would be the, the delta T in degrees Fahrenheit times the flow rate expressed in gallons per minute. And you're probably used to a constant called 500. 500 times delta T times gallons per minute will give you BTs per hour. That's an instantaneous rate of heat transfer. That could change from one moment to the next, depending on what's going on with either the heat source or the load. And all we're doing with a heat meter is we're, we're calculating that, and we're also going to repeatedly calculate that and add it up over thousands and thousands of small, short time increments. And what that does is it gives us the total amount of thermal energy that has passed from the heat source to the load. And again, this can be scaled very small. You could meter an individual heat pump or an individual boiler, you could even meter an individual 
a heat emitter if you wanted to, like a fan coil, or you can scale it in the other direction and, and, and uh, have systems that span miles of piping and uh, heat complete uh, high-rise buildings in, in urban areas. So here's a comparison between that diagram and some actual hardware. So the delta T is being measured by these two temperature sensors. And you'll notice these are not sensors that are just strapped down to the outside of a pipe with a, with a zip tie. There's a fixture here with the uh, Kalefi can take uh, easy meter, a brass fixture that allows for a direct immersion sensor. So the tip of that sensor is directly uh, immersed right down the center line of that pipe. So that's a highly accurate way to sense both the supply temperature and then the, the fixture down below is sensing the return temperature. Uh, you see the flow meter there. Uh, that's a, a fairly small one that's designed for a three quarter inch pipe size. And then the meter itself, that what we call the heat calculator unit, that's mounted on a nearby wall. The two sensors for temperature uh, wire back to that as well as a cable from the flow meter. So think of the heat calculator as the brain. It's receiving signals from the temperature sensors and the flow meter, and it's making this instantaneous calculation. And it's also doing something we call integrating that instantaneous rate over a period of time to get a total amount of energy flow. Now, this concept is not new. And uh, this is a piece of equipment I would love to have my hands on. If I ever created a museum of hydronic heating, I'd love to put this in it. This is actually a purely mechanical heat meter that dates back to 1949. And I had an opportunity in Germany once to, to look at a mechanical room in a hotel. And we, we were coming down through the mechanical room, happened to notice this. And at first I had no idea what it was. I just started looking at what are the numbers on the scales. And you'll see up at the top here, it's actually showing differential temperature and of course, degree C in the European market. And then down here, the thing that really clues you in, this MWH, megawatt hours. Now, when we hear megawatt hours, we probably think of utility electric plants, but you can measure heat in megawatt hours. Now, this is just a drawing that I found that actually shows the internal workings of this meter. And it's using a couple bimetal uh, elements up at the top to actually measure differential temperature. Uh, and then it's using a series of disks and cams and gears to mechanically integrate, mechanically multiply a temperature differential multiplied by a flow rate and actually um, use the result of that multiplication to advance the meter. So, you know, a megawatt hour, in case you're interested, is is 3,413,000 BTUs. So this is obviously, this is a big load in a hotel like this. And um, again, it shows that this technology is not something that was just developed. It's, it's got a very well-established history, especially in the European market. And here's an example of a product. Uh, this is bringing, bringing us up to the mid 80s. And that upper device here, this is a combined flow meter and temperature sensor. And then you'll see one other temperature sensor. So the delta T and the flow rate are being uh, measured by this equipment and it's being um, integrated. And this is probably just analog electronics uh, doing that. And finally, here's a modern heat meter, a Kalefi Conteca meter. You can see the two sensors, uh, temperature sensors, the flow meter, and also the brass fittings that are available, different sizes that allow that sensor to be directly immersed into the fluid. And I just want to point out, if you, if you go online and just do a search, uh, just do a search for heat meter photos, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of different shapes and sizes for these types of meters. Uh, again, it's relatively new in North America, but a very well-established market, both in Europe and also in Asia. Now, here's, a, uh, here's another shot. This is a, a European project. Uh, this is a building probably, if memory serves me, this was over 100,000 square feet of space. And there's no boiler in that building. Uh, that building is connected to a district energy system. And this is the piping that comes in from the underground piping out in the street. And just want to point out, if you're in a mechanical room and you're, you're wondering, gee, does this building have heat metering? Well, what are you looking for in terms of hardware? You're looking for temperature sensors and a flow meter. 
So here's one of the temperature sensors on the incoming line. Here's the other temperature sensor. And this is an ultrasonic flow meter. So it's larger hardware. There's a, a, a view of the flow meter itself. That's a, a non-invasive meter, just uh, basically uh, time sound pulses going through the fluid to, to get uh, a reading on flow rate. And here's a close-up of one of those immersion temperature sensors. You'll see there's a set screw that holds it in place. What you can't see here, uh, these are actually wired in place so they can't be tampered with. Because this, again, this can be used to actually invoice a client for energy. So just like we don't want people tampering with electric meters or gas meters, we don't want the ability, at least undetected ability, for anybody to uh, tamper with the temperature sensors or the flow meter. Now, when a building is connected to a district energy system like this, uh, it's very common to use a large plate and frame heat exchanger as the interface. And this makes sense because if there was a problem in the building, let's say a, a leak developed in the building, we certainly don't want the fluid in the rest of the system, which might heat several other buildings. We don't want that fluid all leaking back potentially into the one building or vice versa. If there was a, a problem with the district system, uh, we don't want the fluid from any given building going back in towards the district system. So there is complete isolation between the fluid in the district system and the fluid in the building using one of the uh, plate, large plate and frame heat exchangers. So uh, at this point, um, I'm gonna ask this first poll question and then Woody's going to tabulate that for us. Um, are you presently using heat metering in any of your hydronic systems? It looks, okay. It looks like... Uh, you see those, Siggy? Yeah, I do. Uh, we're showing 70% no, 21% yes, and 9% not applicable. Um, I would have guessed it might have even been a little higher on the no column there, but that's that's good. That's a good place to start from. So let's keep going. Let's let's take a look at kind of the the thermodynamics that are involved. What what's the math? What's the theory behind doing heat metering? Well. I mentioned earlier that any heat metering requires a measurement of flow rate and temperature difference. And in this e equation here, F would be the flow rate, and that could be water or it could be another fluid, but it's the flow rate. In this case, the units will be gallons per minute. And delta T is the temperature difference between those two sensors, one measuring the heated fluid going to the load and the other measuring the uh, cooler fluid coming back from the load. Now, you might be wondering, what is this over here, this 8.01 DC? Well, uh, D stands for the density of the fluid. And of course, there are slight differences in the density of water and the density of different concentrations of a glycol antifreeze. So we need to account for that. We need to know, the, the meter, I should say, needs to know, is it working with water or is it working with perhaps a 30% solution of propylene glycol? Uh, C is specific heat. How many BTUs a pound of that fluid uh, will absorb for a one degree Fahrenheit temperature rise? And again, that's a fluid specific property that will vary with fluids. And to a slight degree, it all also varies with temperature. In fact, both density and specific heat have variations with temperature and the modern meters can account for that. Uh, they can they can make adjustments for the density and specific heat of the fluid as well as be set to operate with different fluids in the system. So again, the flow rate is measured by the flow meter. The delta T is measured by those two direct immersion temperature sensors. And then the heat calculator puts that all together, does that calculation. And again, I want to stress that that formula is giving us instantaneous rate of heat flow, BTUs per hour, okay? So if you're curious about this, for water, I put a couple formulas down there for calculating how the density and the specific heat of water change as a function of temperature. Um, these are just uh, standard, what, what are called polynomial functions that are fit to uh, very accurate uh, data on how the density of water changes. Of course, you'd have corresponding equations for other fluids. Uh, uh, antifreeze manufacturers oftentimes will publish this kind of data, and uh, you can you could plot it out and fit an equation to it. 
Uh, but again, you don't really have to do that with a modern metering system. That's all programmed into the firmware of the heat calculator unit. So let's just run through an example just to put some numbers into the formula. Let's assume that we've got 140 degree fluid. It's entering a heating distribution system. And let me just move this for a second here. And it's coming back at 127 degrees. And uh, we're, it's moving at exactly five gallons per minute. And we want to calculate what that instantaneous rate of heat flow is. So we calculate, we start with getting our fluid properties. And again, this would be done internal to the heat calculator unit. I'm just showing you essentially the manual equivalent of what that heat calculator is doing. So we calculate the density, we calculate specific heat, and then we put the numbers into the formula and it works out to 31,894 BTUs per hour. Okay, now that's, that's a snapshot. At that moment in time when we have exactly those temperatures and exactly that flow rate, we have a certain instantaneous rate of heat transfer. If this rate was sustained for an hour, we could calculate the total amount of heat that was transferred. And that's a very simple calculation. The total would be the rate times the time. So we're, we're taking a rate in BTUs per hour. We're multiplying it, in this case, by one hour. And we would get 31,894 BTUs. Now, it's very unlikely in most system applications that the rate is going to stay stable for a period of an hour. If you think about hydronic systems, as heat sources turn on and off, zones turn on and off, uh, thermostats go into setback, come out of setback. There's a lot of dynamic action in, in most hydronic systems. And it's very unlikely that these rates will stay stable for a period of an hour. So we need to go to smaller time increments. Now, again, here's a little theory. If we happen to know the temperature uh, drop as a function of time, a mathematical function of time, and we also knew the flow rate as a mathematical function of time, we could actually do this calculation here. This is an integration. Um, some of you that have uh, gone through calculus will remember some of these things, and I'm sure uh, you could come up with a, uh, a test on a, a test question where you could specify a flow rate and a delta T as a function of time and actually just run the math for the sake of just demonstrating that it works. Now, if you look at that as a graph, if this black line here represented the rate of heat transfer versus time, and I'm just showing this over a period of, let's say, 15 minutes, we can obviously see that the rate is changing. Well, what all this represents is just that blue area under the curve. We're integrating a rate times a time over, in this case, over a quarter of an hour, and that would give us a very precise exact amount of heat transfer. Well, when you're doing integrations like this, the time increment is, uh, I think the word was infinitesimally small. So we're, we, we can't do that, but we can do very close approximations to that, okay? And when we go to approximate an integration, we're basically doing a summation. What we're doing in effect is we're taking snapshots and think of multiple snapshots each minute where we're measuring a delta T and a flow rate. And then we're multiplying that by the density specific heat and this constant 8.01 and multiplying it by that short period of time. And that's giving us the amount of heat that was transferred during that short amount of time. And we keep repeating this and we just keep summing up the total. So this is the concept, again, if we look at it graphically, you remember that black line that represented the exact rate of heat transfer. In the blue area, you can see a little bit of the blue area there under the black curve. Well, we're approximating that. In this case, I'm just drawing 15 rectangles and we're gonna assume each one of those is one minute long. And what we're doing within each rectangle is we're taking a snapshot. We're taking a temperature difference times a flow rate times one minute, which would be a 60th of an hour, and that gives us an amount of heat. And then we're gonna repeat that for the second minute, the third minute, and so forth. And we're gonna add it all up. And you know, here's some numbers just as an example. For the first three minutes, I just put down 
temperatures on the supply, the return, what the flow rate was. We calculated the rate and that rate applied for 1 60th of an hour, one minute. So the total energy in that first minute was about 533 BTUs. And then uh, things changed. Uh, both temperatures changed, the flow rate changed slightly. So we had a slightly different rate for that second minute times 1 60th of an hour. That adds up to 562. And if we just kept doing that just for three minutes, we were just summing that up. Now, if you think about this, the narrower these red rectangles are, the, the shorter the amount of time that, that these rectangles represent, the better the approximation is to the exact amount of heat transfer that that integral gave us. Uh, modern meters are going to do this calculation multiple times each minute. So think about it, over a course of an hour, you've got several hundred snapshots that are being used. And the accuracy is good enough. In fact, there are standards of accuracy both in the US and an evolving standard up in Canada and the Kalefi meters meet that standard. So uh, again, I, I wanted to give you a little bit of theory on how these meters operate, okay? Now, speaking of the standards, um, uh, several years ago, the work began on coming up with a North American standard specification for heat metering. And it culminated roughly about a year ago, February 2018, with this ASTM E3137 standard. And if you're interested in that standard, you can go to this website and download it. But suffice it to say, this standard will be cited, very likely to be cited by engineering firms that are specifying heat metering equipment or other specifying organizations as the accuracy standard. And this was really needed to, to create the benchmark for accuracy that would ensure that the customer is being accurately metered, if, especially if the customer on a heat metered system is being charged for their thermal energy. Obviously, they want assurance that the meter is accurate, just like I'm sure there are standards uh, for electric meters, gas meters, almost any kind of a meter uh, has a, a standard associated with it. And finally, uh, in the US, we have this standard to reference. And this is also developing in Canada. Uh, Measurement Canada is, is currently in a pilot program where they're evaluating different meters, uh, setting up a, a lab to measure different meters. Uh, it is legal to install heat meters in Canada right now, but uh, the target date for a standard to be ready in the Canadian market is January 1st, 2021. Uh, meters that have been installed prior to that date uh, up to 2026 can remain in service, but beyond 2026, the way the uh, present uh, course is being set, meters that do not meet that January 1st, 2021 standard would have to be replaced by meters that do meet that standard. And again, I, I gave you a website here that you can go to and read up about what's going on with heat metering in Canada. So it's uh, it, it looks good as a developing market in both the US and also in Canada. Um, now, what are some of the things that are important as far as uh, applying these meters? Well, one of the things that is important to understand is that the temperature sensors that are used with a heat meter, a modern heat meter, are a matched pair. And not only are they matched to each other, they're also matched to the heat calculator unit. So uh, as a matched set, it's extremely important that you do not modify that sensor wiring. And this is just a close-up shot inside a heat meter. And the two cables that you see here going up and connecting here, and you see um, one lead from each cable goes to a common screw. But you notice those screws are sealed. And that, that means don't touch them. Uh, you are not supposed to disconnect the sensors. Obviously, disconnecting a temperature sensor is going to uh, create inaccurate readings in the meter. So there's a, there's a security aspect to it. But you also do not want to do any kind of cutting or splicing on these. And this is new because oftentimes when we're working with other types of temperature sensors in hydronic systems, we're used to splicing a cable on and, and perhaps running uh, you know, an extra 100 feet of cable if we need to, to go from a sensor back to a controller. We do not want to do that because the resistance of the 
cables on these sensors as part of the unit's calibration. And to modify that wiring in any way would potentially affect its calibration. Now, you might say, well, what do I do with the extra cable? You coil it up neatly, put some zip ties on it, and leave it as it's shown there next to the meter. Um, you can order that meter with different cable lengths. So you don't necessarily have to order it with a lot of extra cable and just coil it up, but um, you don't cut it. Now, the flow meter cable is different. The flow meter, in this case, is putting out a pulse signal. So that can be spliced to a cable um, to get that back to the heat calculator unit. Uh, this shows how the sensor goes into the brass fitting. It's part of the uh, Colefi can take a meter system, and that's a stainless steel uh, end probe on that sensor. It seals with an O-ring, and uh, that actually will put the tip of that sensor right down the pipe center line. Uh, that fitting is actually designed so that once the sensor is installed, a small braided stainless steel cable that is supplied with the meter can be uh, woven onto that fixture in such a way that it would have to be cut in order to remove that. And again, that is there just like the seal on an electrical meter. It's there to provide evidence if there was any tampering. And uh, obviously, again, if, if customers are paying for this energy, um, we want assurance that those sensors are, are guarded. And I'll just mention too that there is a, a place over here on the right side of the heat calculator to put that type of a uh, stainless steel cable tie with a lead seal on it. And also the firmware within that meter keeps track each time the cover is removed. And again, these are, these are necessary to provide the functionality to certainly give evidence if that meter has been tampered with. Now, uh, these are some shots that, uh, that Bob uh, took. So I'm gonna let him jump in here and describe what he's doing here or installing the meter. Yeah, thanks, Siggy. So uh, whenever we have a new product come out, I'd like to get my hands on it, install one, and try it out and see how it works myself. So I've got a, uh, in my shop here, I've got a wood boiler. Well, not a wood boiler, but a wood-fired boiler. Um, and I thought I'd just put it on there to see uh, how that thing performs. So I just cut it right into the copper pipe. It has uh, union connections on it. And um, uh, we get press connections or sweat connections that we can put on those tail pieces. And you just uh, pop it in the pipe, um, put the two... Um, Y pattern probe um, receptacles in there. Now, one thing to be aware of on these, which I learned, is that you want to put your sensors in before you put it in and put the water in because that sensor is going into the water. It's not a dry well up here. So make sure before you uh, put the water back in the system and purge it out that you have your sensors in. But uh, yeah, it worked, uh, gosh, probably lots in an hour to pop that in there. And uh, the nice thing about the, the readout on it, in addition to keeping track of all this information, if you wanted to troubleshoot or just know what your delta T is on your system, maybe you want to change your pump speed or something like that, you can just get in there and uh, look at the meter and it's telling you at the instant uh, GPM, the delta T, and also the, uh, the calculation. Yeah, nice looking job. Thanks. Okay, now uh, we're going to jump back in here with another poll question. Uh, do you think that heat metering is applicable to the systems that you either design or install? Yeah, that looks good. 80% uh, indicate yes, that it would be applicable to systems they design or install. 9% uh, no, and 12% not, not applicable. So that I'm looks good as well for promising market. Yeah. Now, uh, we've talked about the technology, we talked about the hardware. What, let's, let's drill down into these benefits a little bit better. And one of, the, uh, one of the sites that I remember seeing on a visit to New York City, and it was a very cold day in January, and we were walking around downtown, I'm sure if we were in Manhattan or the Bronx, but I remember looking up at these high-rise uh, living units, and I was amazed at how many windows were open at the top. Um, so, you know, the, uh, the, the commonly used term, I guess, there was double hung thermostat. Uh, it was a situation where there was central heat production, but there was no metering and apparently no way of charging the, the people that live in each of these units for the actual amount of energy that was being used. And to be fair, there probably was a lack of balancing these systems as well. So these, uh, these upper floor units were overheating and uh, they were counteracting that by just opening the windows. So obviously that's an extremely wasteful 
situation. Uh, if heat meters were installed in projects like that, uh, the heat meter would, would indicate how much energy has been used. And it's, it's certainly doubtful that people would just waste it uh, to the extent that they were. Here's a photo. This, this is a European uh, project, but it shows a, a ModCon boiler. And you can see um, all the heat meters in this case were installed in the mechanical room, a nice looking job. Essentially, it's a set of headers with an individual supply and return out to each unit. And you can see the heat meters uh, lined up here. So again, it's a very well established technology in that market. Now, again, whether we look at retail space, we look at office space over here or living space, uh, when we have an individual boiler in a space like that or a furnace, um, obviously that unit is eventually gonna need service. And if you've uh, done service work on some of these, especially the oil systems, uh, there's always going to be some smell associated with it. There's going to be some noise. There might there might be some smoke, depending on what what kind of service work is being done. Uh, certainly, in a, in a retail space or an office environment, the service tech is going in and out through the space. It's disruptive to the primary use of the space. If you centralize the heat production, uh, you know the heat meter does not necessarily have to be in that space. In fact, we're going to show you how the heat meter can be read just with a two wire cable. So there's really no need to, to involve fuel burning mechanical equipment in any of these spaces. And that, that's a big benefit, especially in, in retail or in office environments. Uh, a safety benefit, certainly the potential leakage of flue gases, including carbon monoxide would be reduced. Um, you know, we have seen over the years, some scary situations with vent pipes that are improperly installed or perhaps it was installed and somebody pushed something up against it, a ladder hit it, whatever, and uh, it's partially disconnected. Uh, obviously that's a, a potentially deadly problem. And with centralized heat production, you're not going to have these flues within these individual units. Uh, and you're not gonna have all these vents coming up through the roof as well. Um, again, aesthetically that's a compromise and certainly from a roof maintenance standpoint, preventing leaks, it's a compromise. Uh, we've talked about uh, the various uh, meter charges involved and just the aesthetics, okay? We eliminate that with a single meter in a centralized heat production situation. Uh, we don't have the piping penetrations through the walls. We don't have just a rack of meters lined up outside the building. And uh, again, uh, potential vandalism is reduced by not having all these meters. Now, uh, I think another technology that is inevitably going to expand in North America, it, again, it's fairly widely used in Europe and in Asia, is uh, district systems, uh, very large scale systems like you might find in a, uh, an urban environment. Uh, district heating has been used uh, primarily with steam in applications, college campuses or is one good example. Military bases typically have used steam and district heating. But uh, when we go back to a water-based system, we can do things uh, like this project, for example. This is up in British Columbia, and you can look this up online if you want to uh, see more about it. But this is a, a biomass boiler that burns either wood pellets or wood chips. It's in, a, in, in that small building. And uh, the map down in the lower right-hand corner here, this is an aerial shot. This shows where the piping goes. Uh, there's probably on the order of half a mile of distance between where the heat is produced and, and where that last client building is. Uh, I know there are different types of buildings connected to this. Some of these are uh, manufacturing facilities. Uh, I believe there's a swimming pool part of the system. Uh, there's restaurants, uh, hotels. So it can be a mix of different clients. And in that building where the biomass boiler is, there is a centralized system that keeps track of how much energy each client has used. And collectively, this system uh, is owned, maintained, and the clients are charged for the energy. And I just think it's a great way, especially with biomass boilers, um, economy of scale here, uh, and other types of renewables mixing heat metering in is just a great way to enable uh, a broader use of those technologies. Uh, it can also be used for performance verification. Bob was mentioning if you wanted to 
check out the energy flow rate from a piece of equipment. Um, certainly, you've got it right there on the meter. And over a period of time, verifying the performance. And some state programs now are actually requiring heat metering in, cer in certain thermal renewable projects with biomass boilers or larger implementation of solar thermal collectors. Uh, they want essentially proof what is the system doing compared to what its um, simulated performance should be. So again, it's a technology you can see down here. Uh, this is a solar domestic water heating system. And here's the heat calculator, the two temperature sensors, and the flow meter just integrated into that. Um, this is a shot that just shows a controller. This was a, a, a European controller on a solar domestic water system. And it's showing you the collector outlet temperature and the return temperature. It's also showing kilowatt hours. And again, that kilowatt hours is a unit of energy, either electrical energy or thermal energy. So this controller had the heat metering function integrated right into it. Now, another concept, uh, again, widely used in Europe and Asia, and I think will be a developing market in North America, is the idea of, um, well, you'll hear these referred to by different names, uh, satellite stations or heating interface units. The basic idea is that each occupied unit, each building unit, whether it's an apartment, a condo, at least office space, has a panel that has hardware on it. And you can see that panel here. And this particular panel has been set up so that it can provide space heating as well as domestic hot water but there's no heat source on that panel. That panel connects using three pipes and um, commonly today that's a corrugated stainless steel tubing. It connects to the building mains. And you'll see there's three mains in the building. There is a hot uh, supply main from let's say a boiler plant. There's the return main and then there's the cold domestic water main. Now let's, uh, let's take a look inside the satellite station just to see what's going on there. Uh, let's start in here. This is the hot water coming in. All right. And the first thing you'll notice, it goes by that temperature sensor. So everything downstream of that temperature sensor is, is going to be recorded energy use. Nothing, nothing can go through this panel without going by that sensor. Uh, we go up here and we've got a couple valves. Uh, one valve opens when there's a call for space heating. And let's look at that one first. Uh, the flow would come over here. It would go through these uh, closely spaced T's. These just provide hydraulic separation between the circulator that's built onto the panel and uh, the antenna of that circulator is to, to move heat through, let's say, a radiant panel system in that unit. Um, and then that flow returns. And you'll see there's a mixing valve there. So for example, outdoor reset control could be enabled. Uh, Pretty much anything that you can do with a standalone radiant system you could do from this panel. Now over here is a flow setting device. This, this would maintain a preset flow rate through that portion of the system whenever it's on. And that's important because the differential pressure in the mains could change depending on how many of these units are active and we want a stable flow rate going through that portion of the um, of the uh, satellite station. So that, that would be a device that would just set that flow rate. And then finally, the water would go back out through the other temperature sensor. So we get the delta T, it would pass through the flow meter. So we obviously pick up the flow and those wire over to the heat calculator. So that's how the space heating function works. Now, what about domestic water? Well, domestic water is heated on demand. And we'll start with a some somebody opens a faucet or turns on a shower. We have a demand for domestic hot water. The flow switch would pick that up probably at about half, maybe 0.6 gallons per minute of flow rate. And that's going to enable this valve to open. Now, depending on how the controls are set up uh, for this particular satellite station, it might also close this valve. And that would give priority to the domestic hot water. Okay, so we, we may not have enough capacity to do both simultaneously, or we might. It, it would depend on a specific project requirement. When this valve opens, the hot water flows down through the primary side of a stainless steel heat exchanger, 
goes through another flow setting device that would maintain that fixed flow rate. And again, it goes out past the temperature sensor and the flow meter. So we are now recording the energy being used for um, domestic water. Uh, the heat from the primary side of the heat exchanger moves to the secondary side. We're showing an anti-scald mixing valve there because remember these mains could be hot. They might be 150, 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we don't want to send water anywhere near that temperature out to the uh, fixture. So we've got an anti-scald valve and that's pretty much it. So imagine installing a panel that might be on the order of uh, maybe two feet or three feet in its dimension into the wall. Here's an example of, of one of those installed. That's the utility cabinet for that unit. Uh, really nice, again, no chance of smells, smoke, carbon monoxide, anything like that. Just uh, keeping track of thermal use for both space heating and domestic water. Some of these panels also incorporate another flow meter uh, so that they can actually measure the domestic water volume that's been used in the system. This particular configuration here doesn't have that. And you'll find these panels offered with these different configurations depending on the project requirements. Now, one of the, the things that that does is it reduces the amount of piping mains that have to go through the building. Uh, we just looked at the configuration over here on the left where we had the three mains. If we were doing um, some other type of approach, we'd have to have a supply and a return for space heating, uh, supply and a return for domestic water because we would have um, that, uh, that would be heated in a mechanical room and then being distributed through the building. And typically in a building with centrally heated domestic hot water, they're going to have a recirculation system that brings the cool water back. So you don't wait five minutes when you open a faucet at the far end of the building. So we're looking at the difference between five riser pipes through the building, uh, some of which are uh, any of the hot pipes and the research pipe would probably be insulated uh, versus three pipes. And that obviously could be a substantial capital cost reduction in the system. More usable space. Uh, I just picked a couple locations here, Syracuse and Burlington, Vermont, just looking up uh, what what's the cost to lease square footage because every square foot that's taken up by a mechanical room is is typically not space that could be used for other purposes. It's, it's not space for retail or offices or uh, obviously not living space. So the reduction in um, the amount of leased or rented floor space, uh, certainly that is a cost um, factor that uh, is offset by the use of heat metering. Now, again, let's, let's take a look at putting this hardware into the system. Uh, when you put any type of device in the flow path, it's going to have some flow resistance to it. Uh, this is the turbine flow meter that's part of the Kalefi Conteca system. And there's a graph over there on the right that shows what the flow resistance is. And typical uh, graph that would plot head loss or pressure drop versus flow rate. And in this case, I, I just put some blue lines on here. If it was a one inch pipe size meter, at 10 gallons per minute, it's creating about a two PSI pressure drop. It's not a lot, but it's, I, I would not say it's insignificant. It is something that should be factored into the hydraulic design of the circuit. Um, you don't want a flow meter like this to impair the flow to the point where it becomes a problem. So just as if you were putting some other component in there, you would account for the pressure drop of the meter. Uh, wiring. How do we connect multiple meters? Well, the, each heat calculator does have a readout and you can push buttons on it and toggle through the different readings. But in a building situation like a condominium or apartments or, or perhaps even leased office space, you really don't wanna to have to go around and physically go into each of those spaces to make a monthly reading on the meter. So these meters can be connected together with a two wire communication bus and there's a couple options for this. Um, if you want to use the data logger unit that comes with the meter, and that data logger unit would keep track of up to 250 separate meters connected to the network, uh, 
you're going to use a protocol called MBUS. And the you'll see here we can we can take a couple leads from our communication up to MBUS, go into the data logger, and then the data logger would connect over to a laptop and there is software that would keep track of all these different accounts. Uh, another option is to instead connect the uh, communication leads through what is called Modbus. And Modbus is one of the protocols that is used in building automation systems. So that could be integrated in. Uh, if you're going to go to a different protocol in the building automation system, there are gateway products. Uh, Kalefi does have a gateway product to convert from Modbus over to the BACnet. So whether it's tied in with building automation or simply a standalone system ultimately tied to a computer, uh, you're running two wires for that. And you're also running two wires for 24 volt power to each of those units. Um, some systems are going to have heating and cooling delivered through the same piping, uh, a two pipe system where there's a changeover. Uh, this just shows a heat source and a chiller, some diversion valves, and then again, the standard equipment, the Delta T with the two sensors and the flow rate with the flow meter. And the Conteca meter will automatically detect whether the system is in cooling or heating. And here's a flow chart that shows the concept of that. And this, this by the way, is also in Hydronix number 24. Uh, what it does is it continually checks, continually checks how does that supply temperature sensor, uh, the temperature at the supply sensor relate to the temperature at the return sensor. And when it sees that the supply minus the return is greater than zero, that implies that the supply sensor is, is a higher temperature. So it says over here in the flow chart, heating is anticipated. So at that point, the meter is thinking it's probably in a heating mode operation, but let's keep going. Now it's going to check to see if the supply minus the return is above some kind of a delta T minimum. And that's going to be a fraction of a degree Celsius. Uh, and that's simply looking to see, is there some measurable delta T there? If the two temperature sensors were identical in temperature, there's no point in, in trying to meter because there's there's no detectable delta T. So once this minimum detectable delta T is established, the next thing that it does is it looks to see is the supply temperature um, greater than what we call uh, the threshold value. And that can be set anywhere from 50 to 195 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the default is 72. All you're doing here is telling the meter that if the supply temperature is below this threshold value, not to meter the amount of energy that's being used. And again, that's that wide range allows you to adapt to heat pump systems or high temperature boiler systems. So if we've met all these if statements, <clears throat> then we start recording on energy use. And over on cooling, it's a very similar situation. If it sees that the supply sensor is lower than a return sensor, it's anticipating cooling. It's going to check for some minimum delta T to be present. And then it's also going to look to see if that minimum temperature is below a certain threshold. And you, again, you can see the adjustments. Just move a window here. That's adjustable anywhere between, oops, that's adjustable anywhere between 35 and 77 degrees Fahrenheit with a default of 64. So again, if these three decisions all verify to yes, the meter is going to start recording and cooling, and then the loop just repeats itself. So again, a system could automatically change back and forth between heating and cooling, and the meter understands that and, and uh, separately meters those. Now, inevitably, we want to get around to invoicing for thermal energy. <clears throat> and I'm going to start this with kind of a uh, disclaimer. Uh, obviously, if a municipality or some government agency either already has a standard on this or at some point enacts a standard, obviously that becomes a legal requirement. But in the absence of any specific legal requirements, essentially the owner of a system that has heat metering in it is 
free to come up with a, an agreement that the clients of that system would either agree to if they're going to uh, you know, live in or, or lease that space if they don't agree with it, you know, it's like any other agreement that uh, uh, they could decline and, and simply not use the space. So let's talk about some of the concepts that should go into the development of this agreement. Okay. Well, obviously, fuel cost uh, has got to go into that. Uh, the agreement would have to have language that certainly reflects the current costs as well as any other surcharges tariffs taxes any any other applicable fees has to be part of the the billing and how those might increase or possibly even decrease over time if the, the fuel cost going to the central plant goes down for some reason uh, the agreement could be structured in a way that allows that savings to be distributed to the clients of the system um, <clears throat> another thing is that there's going to be some heat loss, or if it's a cooling system, some heat gain between the central plant where this heating or cooling uh, energy is being generated and when it gets to each client of the system. There's going to be, for example, in heating mode, there's going to be heat loss from those mains. That is certainly going to uh, create a use for fuel. I mean, the heat, whether it gets to the uh, clients or not, uh, obviously you had it burn fuel to generate that heat. So the total amount of fuel that's being used is if you convert that over to heat, it's it's going to be a greater number than the sum of all these client readings because of the losses of the common piping, I'll call it. How is that going to be factored into the monthly charge that each client pays? And I'm going to sh eventually lead up to a one possible way to do this. Uh, but potentially there, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, maintenance on the system, something breaks in the mechanical room that could uh, re, you know, require an immediate uh, service call. How, how will that be paid for? How will that cost be either absorbed by the owner or will it be distributed out to the different clients of the system? Okay, any required maintenance or service on the heat metering hardware for each building unit uh, will be initiated and paid for. Administrative costs. Somebody does have to read the meter, uh, probably not going from one unit to the next, but reading it at a computer and then issuing invoices. There, there's some administrative time obviously involved in that. And I also put down here a contingency fund. Uh, for example, if a boiler were to break down and it needed an immediate replacement, and let's say the replacement was $5,000, where's that money coming from? Uh, is there a contingency fund that each client of the system contributes to in a monthly payment that eventually uh, builds up a, you know, a reserve or contingency so that a repair like that could be made without necessarily going out and getting a loan or you know, breaking the bank on the owner? And again, these are all just concepts. Uh, I'm not suggesting any specific arrangement of these, but obviously these, these are questions that could come up. Right, and should come up uh, both from an owner's perspective and also from the client's perspective. Now, one approach, and again, I'm not saying this is the approach or should be the approach, but one approach is simply looking at what are these total costs to operate the system and then dividing that up in proportion to each client's metered energy use. So if we have a client, for example, one client, that is using three times as much energy as another client, uh, not only would they be paying for three times the energy, but they might be paying a higher amount towards the contingency fund, towards the uh, line losses and, and so forth. Uh, it's based on the idea that uh, all these fees, both for energy use and maintenance, would be divvied up in proportion to what each client is using. So I'll just give you a quick example. Let's say that the total monthly cost for fuel and any fees associated with that fuel was $3,000. Uh, we're going to assume that we've got a monthly uh, contribution or, or monthly installment for maintenance service administration of $300. Now that, that's for the entire system. We're gonna assume monthly invoicing of clients 
And we're going to assume that uh, the agreement between the owner of the system and each client is such that the cost associated with maintenance on or service on the client's side of the meter, that would be, for example, if uh, a radiator within an apartment springs a leak, all right, we're going to assume that that would be paid for initially by the building owner and then added back into a monthly bill. So ultimately, the the owner of that, or rather the um, occupant of that space would be paying for it, but perhaps not immediately. So what I did, I just made up uh, five hypothetical clients. Uh, here are the meter readings in kilobtus. And then we just, uh, we look at the total here, 2,900 kilobtus. This next column is just the decimal percentage that each client, uh, that reflects each client's use of energy, okay? Uh, here's where we're dividing up the total, the $3,300 total, that would include fuel and maintenance service administration um, contribution. We're dividing that up in direct proportion to these percentages. And then let's assume that a couple clients had work done on the client side of the meter. One was 200, one was $300. Again, those are going to be added to these monthly costs. So these would be the amounts of um, each invoice to each client. Again, this is, is a hypothetical example, but it's at least a starting point for thinking about how to construct this kind of an agreement. Certainly after you have constructed it, I, I would certainly recommend that you'd have an attorney vet it for any issues that could come up. Uh, the, the goal here is to avoid any surprises that uh, each client knows exactly how they're going to be charged. Uh, if something breaks, how is that handled? Uh, when will the invoices arrive? Uh, for example, uh, another question that could come up, suppose we have a contingency fund and it gets up to some value, like $15,000. At that point, do you continue to add to the contingency fund, just let it keep building up, or do you cap it and, and reduce the client's billing? It could go either way, but it should be spelled out. Okay. So that leads us up to our last poll question. Uh, do you know of any laws or regulations in your area that would apply to heat meter? Okay. So it looks like, uh, well, about 9% of people do know of some regulations on that. Be interesting to know um, where those regulations are in effect. And certainly the potential exists for regulations to come into effect as heat metering technology becomes more widespread. So our final section here, let's let's take a look at some example applications, okay. how we can put some of these heat meters to work. So we'll start off with this one. <clears throat> this is a geothermal heat pump system, water to water, and I'm showing it serving three different client loads, each with a separately pumped um, distribution system. So what we've got over here, we've got our geothermal earth loop going to a water to water heat pump. And I'll, I'll just want you to take note, we are also measuring with a different meter, we're measuring the electrical energy consumption to the heat pump. And I'll show you why we're going, what we're going to do with that shortly. Uh, we're measuring all the thermal energy that leaves the heat pump and goes to the buffer tank. So we've got a flow meter here now. That symbol represents a larger flow meter. Uh, when you get up into, I believe it's the inch and a quarter, inch and a half pipe size of the Conteca meter, there's a different flow meter body, but fundamentally it's doing the same thing. It's, it's creating pulses based on how much flow has gone through it. And we have the two temperature sensors. So we've got our overall energy flow from the heat pump to the balance of the system. And over here, you can see we've got delta T and flow rate, we've got a separate can take a meter on each of these client loads. And the dash line just represents that all these meters, whether it's measuring the total amount of energy coming from the heat pump or the amount of energy going to each individual load, it's all uh, connected together with a two wire bus that goes over to the data logger on MBUS communication. And finally, that uh, is read by software on the computer. So <clears throat> since we're measuring over here on the left, we're measuring both the thermal output of the heat pump 
and we're measuring the electrical input, you're probably thinking, well, what could we calculate if we know those two? And the answer is we can calculate the coefficient of performance. So, and not only can we calculate COP, we can do it on two different bases. We can calculate on a moment by moment basis what the instantaneous coefficient of performance is. And all it would be would be the uh, kilobtus per hour reading from the Conteca meter that is connected to the heat pump. So that's our total energy flow leaving the heat pump. And we're dividing that by, let's assume we had 2.5 kilowatt uh, power supply rate to the heat pump. We're converting from kilowatts over to BTUs per, or kilo, kilo BTUs per hour by multiplying here 3.413. So we just do the simple math there. We get a instantaneous COP of about 3.5. So again, one of the really nice features of a heat meter is that you've got verification of how that that piece of machinery is operating, whether it's a boiler or a heat pump. If it you know, if it's supposed to be operating at a coefficient of performance of pick a number five and you see it at 3.5, obviously something is something's wrong or something is certainly different from the conditions at which it was rated. So it's a very helpful diagnostic tool when you're commissioning a system or if you're coming back and doing service on a system. Now, the other thing that you can do, since uh, we have total amount of thermal energy over a period of time, let's say over any period of time, it could be a day, a week, a month. I'm just saying over some period of time, we've registered on the Conteca meter, 5,000 kilobtus of heat energy have passed through that meter. And our electrical meter is also recording kilowatt hours, 475 kilowatt hours. Again, we're converting the kilowatt hours over to kilobtus per kilowatt hour by multiplying by the same factor. So now our COP over a period of time, our average COP, 3.08. So you could actually find the average coefficient of performance of that heat pump over an entire heating season. Uh, which which is a nice number to know because it, it allows you to do an energy cost uh, estimate with accurate data as opposed to snapshot data that you typically find in uh, manufacturer's literature. It's an integrated seasonal performance indicator. So that's that's a nice uh, feature. Now, here is a an example when we talked earlier about the satellite stations or the heating interface units, as they're called in Europe. This just shows a concept of how some of those could be set up. Uh, we'll start with some kind of a uh, multiple boiler system. I'm showing three. It could be, you know, it could be one boiler, it could be three boilers. Uh, there's some type of a performance uh, spec there. Uh, we're putting in a hydraulic separator so we can separate the pressure dynamics of the boiler circulators from a variable speed circulator. And uh, I'll show you why that variable speed circulator is, um, why we're using a variable speed circulator shortly. Um, up here on the left, we've got a couple heating interface units that do space heating only. So what you'll see here is a, a heat meter, two temperature sensors, flow meter, a zone valve or a motorized ball valve, depending on what the flow requirement is. And this would be the flow setter that would fix the flow rate. So when this zone opens, this is going to maintain a specific flow rate from the hot water main up through a pair of closely spaced tees and then back over to the return main. And over here on the left, we've got some kind of a mixing valve and circulator, and then I'm showing some radiant panel circuits. These could be circuits, home run circuits going out to panel rads. They could be going out to little fan coil units or uh, other types of heat emitters. Um, over on the right, we've got space heating and domestic hot water. So we're adding another valve. We're adding that stainless steel heat exchanger, an anti-scald mixing valve, a flow switch. And again, each one of these stations has a Conteca meter in it. All those meters are wired together with a two wire bus that come down to the data logger and then off to the laptop computer. Now, what about variable speed here? Well, think about any system that has valve-based zoning in it, whether it's zone valves, motorized ball valves, uh, thermostatic radiator valves, or 
uh, even manifold valve actuators. Anytime we're opening and closing valves and changing the flow rate in the distribution system, uh, we're going to get, with a fixed speed pump, we're going to get a change in differential pressure. And you could imagine a scenario here where only one of these stations is operating. We're going to have perhaps excess differential pressure if it were a fixed speed pump. So by using a variable speed pump, the pump will automatically adjust its speed as these different satellite stations come online and go offline. And not only does that regulate differential pressure, but it also saves energy as fewer and fewer of these stations are operating, that pump can reduce its power input. So very much state-of-the-art in a lot of different ways. The, the multiple boiler system, uh, the hydraulic separator with magnetic particle separation, because anytime we have high efficiency circulators with permanent magnet motors, I'd, I'd like to see a magnetic separation capability in the system. And again, state-of-the-art in terms of heat metering and how we're using hardware to create either space heating only or a combination of space heating and on-demand domestic water heating. And I, I do want to point out these uh, satellite units, even though those are likely to come available at some point in North America as a pre-manufactured unit, there's nothing that prevents someone from building these, customizing these and building these for a project that might need perhaps a hundred of these. Uh, you could certainly set up a design and a, and a fabrication and take these out on site. So uh, lots of flexibility there. Okay, uh, this is just a close up. Uh, I think we've talked through most of this now, the heat meter, the two zones. Again, this could have priority for domestic water heating where when this valve opens based on a demand for domestic hot water, um, this valve would shut temporarily stopping heat input to the um, space heating system. And then as soon as the domestic load is satisfied, uh, it would go back to space heating. Um, here's another application. This is a district system, a, a mini district system. We've actually been involved in a system that is similar to this uh, up at a, a state facility in, uh, in the Adirondack Park where there are three pellet boilers supplying 1.7 million BTUs per hour. They're controlled in a staged system. Uh, there is a 1400 gallon thermal storage tank. And then there are three underground pre-insulated line sets that go to three different agency buildings. Uh, the flow rate in each one of those distribution uh, segments is controlled by, well, in this schematic, it's controlled by a variable speed pump. Uh, that pump could respond to the demand in the building. And each of those line sets, uh, you can see there is a heat meter uh, out. In this case, the heat meter is installed out at the building. It could be installed back at the main plant here as well. Again, it would be delta T uh, across these mains and flow. The flow is going to be the same. The delta T could be a little bit different. It, it just depends on do we want to include the heat loss of the underground piping in the heat meter reading or or not include it. And either either way could be done. <clears throat> you could do both and actually calculate the difference would be the, the heat loss in the underground piping. Now, um, there is a plate frame, or if it's a small building, it could be a brace plate heat exchanger that separates the, the fluid in the building itself from the district system. And then we're integrating an auxiliary boiler in our other standard hydronic components for air separation, dirt separation. And um, I'm showing a service bypass here. If for some reason the heat exchanger had to be taken apart and cleaned in 10 years or, or whatever, or otherwise needed service, uh, that valve could be open, these two could be closed, and now we're back to just the system operating off the auxiliary boiler. And again, this could be scaled to different types of boilers, um, different combinations. Certainly the number of clients on the system could be changed. Um, the Conteca system, again, up to 250 meters, all connected with a two-wire communication bus, and everything goes back to the data logger and to the computer. And that's it. So let's pause here, and uh, Bob, I'm go back to you. I guess that's a wrap. Well, thanks again, Siggy, and to the team up in Milwaukee, and all the po folks that attended and uh, keep in touch. Thanks. 
Thank you.